Uh, good morning again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to this um, debate discussion uh, on who is Christ from a, a Christian and biblical perspective. My name is Charles. I'm going to be the co-chairperson of this um, debate or discussion. I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to introduce the speaker who is going to talk uh, on the Christian perspective to Christ. Uh, the name of the speaker is Strive Chikwanda. Chikwanda is a holder of a Bachelor of Technology degree, Bachelor of Theology degree, sorry. He is a married man. He has two children, a boy and a girl. He's married to Lucy. Currently, he's an accounting student here at UKZN, and he's also a preacher at the Church of Christ at UKZN. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I greet you in the name of the Almighty, the most beneficent, the most merciful. It is only through his grace and blessings that we, that we have in our presence, Mulana Abu Bakr Aku, an esteemed scholar of Islam based in Louis Trichad. We thank him once again for coming down today. Mulana Abu Bakr Aku, age 26, was a Hafiz al Quran at age 12. He thereafter went on to further his studies at the Darul Ulum Newcastle, from where he graduated at age 17. Currently a businessman and a student of comparative religion, he also man manages the Way of Jesus Center. He is married with two children, Muhammad and Maryam. We're just going to be setting, setting down a few rules for this debate. The intention of this debate is to promote healthy discussion between the two opposing parties in an informative and interactive manner. The idea is not to attack the personality of either individual and to respect one another at all times. We request that all spectators remain seated and that silent phones are turned to silent mode now. Please be aware that the topic of religion is very sensitive. Our speakers are well educated and do not intend to offend anyone. Should any individual from the crowd get out of hand, they may be requested to remain silent or leave the venue. Thank you. And gentlemen, may I call upon our speaker who is going to um, talk on Christ from the biblical perspective, Brother Strife Chikwanda. Over to you, brother. Mr. Chairman, and your co-chair, uh, my fellow students, I want to address the become accounting students and uh, fellow students from the University of uh, KwaZulu Natal here in PMB, and uh, the members of the church who are here, and my Muslim friends from all over. We have come to grace this occasion. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 For those who speak Zulu. Amen. The topic of the day is who is Jesus Christ? And as I in introduce my lesson, I just want to say this few points. To learn anything in life, a man needs to have the right attitude. To understand God, whose name is Yahweh, a man needs to have an open mind toward learning and toward the available sources from which one can learn. Unless God had revealed himself to us, we would never have known him. In the book called Deuteronomy chapter number 29, verse number 29, it is written, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, so that we may do or we may follow all the words of this law. This is Moses writing. And God tells him, there are things that I have decided to keep secret. Leave them secret. And there are things that I have revealed. Those things that I have revealed, I have revealed them for a purpose. I want you to do them and, and I want you to keep the words of this law. This is the Torah that we are talking about. God has been incrementally revealing himself from the foundation of the earth and to the apex of Revelation, which we call Jesus Christ. Revelation itself closed with Jesus and the apostles who recorded the words and the teachings of Jesus Christ. I want you to get me on these few points. In a book called Galatians, chapter number one, verse number eight and nine, I'm quoting from Apostle Paul. Why do I love Apostle Paul? Uh, one of um, our scholars, his name is Dr. Zach Naik, he's preaching in India. He caught him, and because he caught him, I can caught him as well. I think because he caught him, 
I believe he must be saying the truth. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than we have preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. This is Paul. He says we've done everything. It's done. If somebody comes, even if they're coming from heaven, and they say, the gospel has been changed. There is this new gospel. You must know. A liar is standing before you. I want to talk briefly about the scriptures. The scriptures that I have and the scriptures that I recognize, they are made up of 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books to make 66 books of the Bible. And the Bible is not a book about religion. I'm not a preacher of religion. The Bible is a book about God and man. The apostles of Jesus Christ were enabled or empowered to understand fully the law, the Psalms, the prophets, and were, and were guided by the Holy Spirit to understand and to remember what Jesus had taught them for three years. They preached this message first orally, and then later on they wrote it down with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the original autograph, what, what they wrote, we do not have it today. It is with God. I don't need the original autographs. One of the most amazing things about God, or this God that is called Yahweh, is that he always knows the right time to do things. And he knows the best way to accomplish his plans. God's revelation came through a special and exclusive lineage chosen specifically for this purpose. Mark, please put up the slide there for me. That choice that God made was not meritorious, but once Yahweh chooses somebody or someone to do some work for him, the choice comes with merits. So that the person who has not been chosen uh, does not enjoy the same merit. So this choice that God made, it's a sovereign choice of God that cannot be challenged. What you have up there is, um, I'm going to start from Father Abraham, because we both agree on Father Abraham. So I'm starting from Father Abraham. Father Abraham um, um, he, he was born in a family that worshipped God. Um, I wanted to start from, from Abel, because I'm going to ask a question, something related to Abel, but I want to start from Father Abraham. The things that I want you to note about Father Abraham is that he had two sons. The firstborn was born when Abraham was 86 years old, and his name was Ishmael. And the second born, or, or the second son that Abraham had, his name was Isaac. He was born when Abraham was 99 years old, and his wife Sarah was 90 years old. I want you to know that Ishmael was born according to a human plan. It was Sarah's suggestion to Abraham that, no, I do not think that this promise that God has given us for a son is going to materialize. Please take Hagar and uh, um, have intimacy with her and raise a son for me. There's nothing more that you know or that we, we know about Ishmael, except that one day Ishmael and Isu, um, I mean, one day Ishmael and Isaac were playing. And Sarah saw, according to the Bible, Ishmael playing sport with Isaac. My understanding of playing sport with Isaac is the way Ishmael played with Isaac, he treated him with cruelty. And Sarah didn't like it. And she went to Abraham and says, No, Abraham, cast away the bondwoman and her son, because this son here is not going to inherit together with my son. And the thing displeased Abraham. And whilst Abraham was displeased, God went to Abraham and says, No, let this thing not displease you. Because it is through Isaac that I'm going to bless you. And Ishmael is dismissed. So I'm coming to Isaac. Isaac was born. And uh, this boy here was sacrificed, I mean, was, uh, was circumcised when he was eight days old. I want you to remember Jesus was circumcised when he was eight days old. This boy here, um, God asked Abraham to go and offer his one and only son, the one whom he loved, Isaac, and he was mentioned by name. 
and Abraham took his son and he went to the place that God had said he was going to show him and uh, he went with his servants and they walked for three days and they got to a certain point where they were seeing the mountain where they were going to go or where Abraham was going to go and sacrifice Isaac. Isaac does not know this. The servants do not know this. So Abraham said to the servants, you stay here. The boy and me, we are going to go further. We are going to go and worship God and we are going to come back. Powerful statement. And uh, he continued the journey with, uh, with Isaac. And it is on this second leg of the journey that Isaac asked a fundamental question. They are walking. And Abraham says, I mean Isaac says, Father, uh, um, I can see that we have the knife. I can see that we have the firewood. I can see we have the ropes and everything that we need uh, for, for, for sacrificing. Because they used to go and sacrifice. Where is the lamb that we are going to go and sacrifice? Powerful statement. I don't know who told Abraham this answer. But Abraham says, um, the Lord himself will provide a lamp for himself. And then the issue was settled. And they continued. I don't know whether you believe that the lamp that Abraham was talking about is a lamp that they saw there at Mount Calvary. Because the spot that Isaac was put on the altar is the exact spot that Jesus Christ, my Lord, was crucified. The exact spot. Isaac also had children. He had uh, Jacob. And uh, Jacob also had children. And Jacob had 12 sons. Uh, and the 12 sons were all chosen by God. I just want to mention Joseph. Joseph was the forerunner for the children of Israel into Egypt. And uh, Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, people who descend from Ishmael. He was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Some people have said, uh, some scholars have said, uh, uh, Potiphar must have shortchanged the Ishmaelites for, for paying 20 pieces of silver instead of the 30 that were paid for Jesus. And uh, the other son that I want to talk about is Levi. Levi is from, uh, the, uh, from where the high priest and the priest were going to descend. And I also want to talk about Judah. Judah is the tribe from where Christ will be born. And the notable figure that I want to mention there is King David. And then from King David, I descend to Joseph and Mary, who were both descendants of, uh, uh, of Judah. And then we come to Jesus. You can close that uh, slide, Mark. <coughs> if you don't know the Quran, you are one step behind today. From this lineage that I've shown you, we have all the inspired people through whom God delivered his message. And these inspired people amplified God's message. They elaborated God's message. They clarified the law. Outside this lineage that I've shown you, we have thieves and liars and false prophets and antichrists. None of the biblical prophets were Muslims. None of them worshipped a God whose name was Allah. They all knew his name and they recorded it and they have already given you the name. Neither Ishmael nor any of the non-Hebrew people were prophets because God did not choose them. Be warned about fighting against God's will because in the end you will lose. None of the prophets received books from God except the two tablets of stone which were written by the finger of God which were given to Moses on which the Ten Commandments were written. And I like it because when the finger of God was writing on the two tablets of stone, he had to write in the language that Moses would understand. What language did Moses speak? Hebrew. And today I have the Hebrew scriptures. If you want to quote from them, I'm also going to give you so that you can read them and you can hear. This inspired people when they received God's message. Most of them, they just preached it orally. Some of them, they wrote it down in their own words. In the first person singular. Sometimes in the third person singular. And when they were using direct words from the mouth of God, they would use quotation marks. 
And when they spoke, they says, thus says the Lord. God has preserved and protected the holy writings through the efforts of holy people and powerful people in history so that today I want you to know that God's word is here. Jesus was not given the lost angel or the lost gospel. There is no information about Jesus that has been lost. If that had happened, it means that God would have lost uh, control of the plan of salvation. Yahweh is not a newcomer in the office of being God. He is not a trainee. He is not a trainee accountant or he's not an article clerk. God is not learning from trial and error. I want you to smile because Yahweh is still in control and he's calling you. Who is Jesus? Yeshua in Aramaic. Jesus in Greek. Yehoshua in Hebrew. Yasu or Yesu in Arabic. Jesu in Shona. How do you call him in Zulu? Jesu. How do you call him in Afrikaans? Jesus. How do you call him in, in Venda? Jesu. How do you call him in which is that? Sutu. Jesu Christu. He is not the Isa mentioned in the Quran. He was born between 4 BC and the year 0 in Bethlehem, Judea, during the time of the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. And Herod was the king of Judea. Quirinius was the governor of Syria. During the Fourth World War Empire, that God had told Nebuchadnezzar that he was going to establish his kingdom in 550 BC. Jesus did not verify the earlier prophets. He fulfilled what the earlier prophets had said about him. He was compliant with what they had said. He lived up to the standards that they had set about him. He brought to fruition every word that it uttered about him. Jesus did not teach about a religion he taught about the kingdom of God. When he started preaching, he says, no, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Throughout his teaching, he was explaining the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Even after the resurrection, he spoke about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We need a few hours on earth just before he left. And Jesus is not known by a different name in different languages. He is not just one of the prophets of God. He is the prophet. His mother was Mary. She was not the daughter of Imram or a sister of Aaron who had died more than a thousand years before the time of Jesus. Unlike Isa, Jesus did not speak as a child or as an infant. He did not do magic or pointless miracles like breathing life into clay beds. He refused to do self-saving miracles. When the devil asked him in the wilderness, when he was being tempted, he refused to do pointless miracles. Just after his baptism, he did not foretell the coming of the prophet Muhammad. Neither does any of the prophets, because after Jesus, a believer in God does not need a prophet. Who is Jesus talking about in these passages here? I'm quoting these passages here because um, Ahmed Dedad, um, I know that he's late, he's late and, um, and Dr. Zahid Naik, they quote these passages, and I get my authority from them, the fact that they quote them, I want to believe they must be accurate. John chapter number 14, verse number 16 and 17, and verse number 26. And I will ask the Father, underline Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may abide with you forever, underline forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, underline see him or know him. For he abides in you and is in you, verse number 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, underline those whom the Father, underline that as well, will send in my name, underline in my name. He will teach you of all things and you bring to your remembrance everything that I've said to you, underlines bring to your remembrance everything that I've said to you. So Jesus is calling another man, Father. And he says this Jehovah was going to come. He was going to abide with you 
forever. This person then cannot be talking about Prophet Muhammad because Prophet Muhammad is not with us here today. And uh, this helper who was coming, he says, no, the world cannot see him. Neither do they know him. And in verse number 26, he says, no, he is a counselor. He is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father was going to send in the name of Jesus. And he was going to bring to remembrance the things that Jesus Christ had taught. In chapter number 16 of John, verse number 13 and 14, however, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all the truth, for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he is, that he will speak, and he will declare to you the things to come. He will glorify me, and you take of mine, and you declare it to you. I want to ask you a question as I'm going down. Why did Isa come to earth? From where did he come? And to which people did he belong? Because the Jews have no record of him. Unlike Isa, Jesus died on the cross after he was being he was crucified on Thursday, the 14th day of the month of Nisan in AD 33, and he was resurrected on Sunday morning. On the third day, having spent Friday in the grave, Saturday in the grave, in line with what the prophets had said about him and what he himself had taught. In Acts chapter number 1, verse number 3 and 4, to this man, he also showed himself alive after his uh, suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them 40 days and speaking of the things containing, concerning the kingdom of God and being assembled uh, together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which is say to you, ye yet of me speak. So this promise that, uh, this counsel that Jesus Christ promised to, to the apostles, he, he came during the life of the twelve. And Jesus says, no, don't leave Jerusalem until you have received this promise that you are, uh, I have told you about in AD 33. What were Jesus' scriptures? Hebrew scriptures. I was reading with one of my friends the Hebrew scriptures just now in Genesis. And he says, no, don't read word for word, read fluently. And I said, Hebrew is not my language. But I will go word for word. So when he was reading in Genesis chapter number one, uh, verse number one, he called God Elohim. He also read Greek scriptures because uh, uh, the Hebrew scriptures had to be translated into, into Greek because the Jews were scattered all over the world and their children would not know the Hebrew language. They would have not learned the Greek language from where they were born. So for them to be able to have access to the word of their God, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek and the translation is called the Septuagint and we have it here today. Those who can read Greek, you'll be able to read it to me and show it uh, some scriptures to me from the Septuagint as well. So in that language, when Jesus Christ was reading from the Septuagint, he called God Kurie Hothios in Greek. And God in his wisdom chose to reveal the New Testament in a language that will reach the greatest number of people at a time, uh, at, at that time. And I say to you, he would have called, or when he was talking about God, he would have called him Kurie Hothios. And Jesus Christ affirmed the accuracy and the authority of the Old Testament of his day by quoting from it, by reading it, by teaching from it, by mentioning the figures as real people who lived. Neither did he call God or the God of the Hebrews Allah because that was not his name and it is not his name. What does God say about Jesus? I love this passage. When I'm talking to my friends um, who are all here today, they, they quote to me, they quote this passage to me, and because they caught it, I want to believe it's accurate. Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 18. I will raise up to them a prophet of their brethren, like you, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them as I command him. And whatever men shall not listen to whatever words that prophet shall speak in my name, I'll take vengeance on him. I want you to relax. Because if you do not listen to the words of this prophet, I'm not going to do anything to you. Because that's not my job. Because God says, no, whatever man will not listen to my words that this man is going to speak, that I put in my mouth, I'm the one who's going to take vengeance. And 
Remember the chart that you saw there? He says this man or this prophet was going to come from their brethren, from their brothers. Whose brothers? The Israelites. Like who? Like you, Moses. And I'll put my words in his mouth. And if a man does not listen to that prophet, he says, no, I'm going to take vengeance on him. I want you to see that it's getting dangerous because there are some of us sitting here right now today who have never listened to this prophet mentioned. The crux of my message. I'm at the crux of my message. In Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 17. This is after the baptism of Jesus Christ. And the verse says, And behold, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I don't know the direction of heaven. Do you know where heaven is? I'm just guessing it's this way. So from this way, a voice came when Jesus Christ was baptized. And he says, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I don't know who was talking. You can tell me who was talking from the direction called heaven. In Mark chapter number 9, Matthew, by the way, is a Hebrew. In Mark chapter number 9, Mark is another Hebrew. Verse number 7. This is at the Mount of Transfiguration. And there are three witnesses there who were three core disciples of Jesus Christ. And uh, Moses, who had died a thousand years, 400 before Christ was born, appeared. And Elijah, who had died 700 years before Jesus Christ was born, appeared. And they were speaking to Jesus, according to, Matthew, um, according to Luke, about the departure that Jesus Christ was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. And Peter tried to suggest something. I don't know what he tried to suggest. But uh, when he tried to suggest that something, the, the writer here in, in Mark, he says, no, and the cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. In Psalm chapter number two, verse number seven. I'm just giving you the verse. Declaring an ordinance of the Lord. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Declaring an ordinance of the Lord. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. This is David writing this psalm. In Psalm chapter number 45, I, I don't know whether you know this, but Psalm is not written by David. The whole of Psalm is not written by David alone. It's written by many writers. I'm telling you what the sons of Korah wrote. In Psalm chapter number 45, verse number 6 and 7. And God here in this passage is speaking about a might one. And he says, no, a certain might one. And he says, no, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil of gladness beyond your fellows. This passage here is quoted by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 5. For to which of the angels did ye ever say, you are my son, this day I have begotten you, and you again will be, and again I will be to him a father, and you will be to me a son. Verse number 8 of Hebrews, chapter number 1. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. This is coming from the mouth of God. God declared Jesus divine. God declared Jesus' dominion and dignity and throne and kingdom and, and the scepter of his kingdom. God declares the eternal duration of the dominion and the dignity of Christ. God declares the imperfect equality of his administration. And uh, God declares that Christ is no fellows when it comes to the work of med mediation. He is superior to all the prophets and the priests and the kings. And his name is higher than any name. And through his name, salvation is made possible. What did Jesus say about himself? In John chapter number 5, verse number 17 and 18, and verse number 39, it says, Jesus said to them, My father always is at work to this very day, 
and I am too working. For this reason, the Jews tried to, uh, or they had to kill him. Why? Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The Jews understood the message of Jesus, and this. they wanted to kill him for breaking their Sabbath, and also for claiming to be equal with God. In verse number 21 and 23 to 23, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even the son gives life to whom he is pleased of giving it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but he has trusted judgment to the son that all may honor the father. And he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. This is one of the key verses that I want you to get. It's written in John chapter number 8, uh, verse number 51 to 59. I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, this is Jesus talking, he will never see death. At this the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Get this statement. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps your word, he will never see death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim to be your God, is the one who glorifies me, through, uh, though you do not know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And I'm putting four question marks. Why do they want to stone Jesus Christ? But I want to go back to the thoughts that I've raised in this verse here. I just want you to know, from the mouth of the Jews, Abraham had died, and the prophets had already died when Jesus Christ was born. And uh, they repeated the thought again. They said, no, he died and so did the prophets. All the prophets that were sent to the Jews had already died when Jesus Christ was born. And then he says in verse number 50, I tell you the truth, uh, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. In Greek, before Abraham was born, ego and me. Exodus chapter number 3, verse number 14 and 15. I know this passage because my friends caught it to me and they say, you know, this is how we, we, we praise our God. This is how we pray exactly like Moses did at that mountain where he saw the burning bush. And they caught this passage here. And uh, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am He sent you. He sent me to you. God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. So his name has not changed. What did others say about Jesus? Gabriel is our favorite angel because um, Prophet Muhammad says he received his revelation through him. In Luke chapter number 1, verse number 32, Gabriel is speaking. He will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. Verse number 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What, what's wrong with Gabriel? What, what? I don't know whether you see this problem that I'm seeing. Gabriel is talking to Mary. He says the son or the only one who is going to be born is going to be called the son of God. Now he comes 570 years after Christ. He says to Prophet Muhammad, God cannot have a son because he cannot have a wife or he does not have a wife. Here he's telling Mary, the one to be born from you, whose son is he? The son of God. 570 years down the line, he says to, to Prophet Muhammad, God cannot have a son. So I'm saying to you, if God spoke to Mary, if Gabriel spoke to Mary, he did not speak to Prophet Muhammad. If he spoke to Prophet Muhammad, he did not speak to Mary. I want to speak about the angel, Simon and Zachariah. In Luke chapter number two, 
verse number 10. But the angel said to them, the angel is talking to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Verse number 11, I love this verse. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Christ or the Messiah or the anointed Lord. I know that we are coming from teachings where we are told that no, he does not save. If he does not save you, you won't get salvation. But this angel here says no. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Christ. In Luke chapter number 2, verse number 32, Jesus is eight days old. And he was brought to the temple. And a certain gentleman who was called Simeon, and he got revelation from God. In fact, God had spoken to him earlier on, and he told him, you are not going to die until you receive, or oh, you see my salvation. Now he sees an eight-day-old boy, and he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have preferred in the sight of all the people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of your people Israel. I want you to see that Simeon had not seen salvation. Simeon saw an eight-day-old boy called Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, he says, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. One of my favorite prophets in the Bible, his name was Zechariah. He prophesied 400 years before Christ was born. In Zechariah chapter number 3, verse number 8 and 9. This is a powerful passage. This scene here happens in heaven. And the high priest Joshua appeared in heaven. And Zechariah was called up to heaven. And he's seeing what is happening before the throne of God. And the high priest Joshua, I think he would dress it like my, my friend uh, Yusuf. I think he would dress like him. Probably with a turban. I don't know. And uh, the high priest was dressed in tatters on that day. He is in tatters. And he's appearing before God. The high priest was not allowed to go into the temple, the Hall of Holies, in tatters. He was supposed to wash. He was supposed to dress nicely. On this day, he is in tatters. And you know who was standing next there? On the side of the throne? The devil was there. He still had access to heaven. And you know what he was doing, going to be doing there? He was there to lay accusations. I think after this talk, I'm going to hear accusations. I'm prepared. And um, there were fellows of uh, uh, Joshua, the high priest, who were sitting. And then God began to speak. He said, listen, oh, high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. See, the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that stone. And our engraved an inscription on it says the Lord Almighty. The reason why I want this passage is this next phrase that is coming. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. I don't know. Which day do you know that God dealt with the sin of our world or with the sin of our, uh, uh, the, this place that we live in, in a single day? If we had a single day in which God dealt with the sin of the world in a single day, Zechariah chapter number 9, verse number 9 and verse number 11. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout it, and of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and giving salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. You might have yet this king, or this gentleman who went to Jerusalem one day, and he's sitting on the fowl of a donkey. And he says, he's so gentle. He's not, a, he's not a warrior. And he says, no. He's gentle. And he's sitting on, the, on, on this donkey. And the fowl of a donkey. And he says, as for you, the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. As I'm talking today, many people, though they've been freed from the waterless pit, they don't want to come out. I want you to know that we have been freed. Why do we die for our own sins? Why are we refusing God's salvation? 
You have been cheated, people. Today you can receive your salvation and life will never be the same again. John the Baptist, Philip and Nathaniel, I'm concluding this. In John chapter number one, verse number 29, John the Baptist, I like this because my friend Yusuf, we had made a covenant. I think he's the one who, who, who tried to, to, to do his part of the bargain. I'm going through the Quran, my brothers and my sisters, uh, and I'm seeing powerful things in the Quran. And uh, I had challenged my four friends through which this debate came and said, no, just read the Gospels. I'm reading the whole Quran. You just read four. I know it's hard for them. John uh, sees Jesus coming the next day toward him. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has seen Jesus. He says, no, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In John chapter number 1, verse number 45 and 49, Jesus has called Philip. And then Philip went and found his friend whose name was Nathaniel. And Nathaniel told Philip, uh, 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 Philip told Nathaniel, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and of whom the prophet also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And uh, Nathaniel says, can anything good come of Nazareth? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Philip says, no, come and see. I want you to know, some of you here are studying accounting. Some of you could be CAs already. Uh, um, this Nathaniel here was prof uh, exercising what is called professional skepticism. He was not naive. He just, you know, we found him, then, oh, yeah, that, that's him. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then he says, no, come and see. And then Nathaniel and Philip are marching. They are going to Jesus. And then Jesus sees them as they are coming. And Jesus says, no, behold, a true Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel says, no, I haven't even greeted you. How do you know me? How can you say these statements? And uh, Jesus says, no, I saw you when you were sitting under the sycamore tree before uh, Philip came to call you. He had the statement from Nathaniel, verse number 49. Nathaniel declared. Nathaniel realized we don't need arguments here now. I think this is something great. Nathaniel declared, he says, no, no more arguments. Rabbi or Rabun, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. What do I say? Apart from the scriptures, I say nothing to you. I want to say to you, this is a good starting point that you have made. I commend you for this. I salute you for this. Are you in doubt? If you're in doubt, go back to where you came from. And think about these things. If you want to ask further guidance, come in private. If you want to come publicly, come publicly and seek further guidance. Don't stop here now. Jesus is the Savior. You need to hear his word. You need to understand his word. You need to ask questions if you have not understood. If you have done this, then believe. If you have believed, the next step is to repent. If you have repented, the next step is to confess. If you have confessed, the next step is to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the mighty God. He is the light of the world. He is the door of the sheep. He is the bread of the life. He is the bread of life. He is the good shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. He is the truth and he is I am. The question is stained from me to you. What do you say about Jesus? I thank you. Thanks for your input, Brother Strive. I now call upon Mulana Abu Bakr Aku to address the floor. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of the one true God, who is the most gracious, the most merciful. Respected Chairman, respected Mr. Strive, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters, 
I welcome one and all with the greeting of Jesus and Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Meaning, peace, mercy, and blessings of God be with you. I begin with the words of Peter, the disciple of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter says, Ye men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him. Note, Peter calls Jesus a man. And also note that Peter does not call the miracles Jesus' miracles.